I'd like to welcome you all to our virtual AI in Action Meetup NLP series. My name is Mark Kelly, the co-founder of Aldis. In today's meetup, you'll hear from David Kern, ML engineer, speaking about multilingual customer service, NLP with Python, and Lucas Kemkes, co-founder at Createx. Lucas will share an introduction to the big NLP trends of the last three years. Today, after the, each presentation, we'll answer some questions, to, uh, pose some questions to our guest speakers. So please put some comments in the comment box and we'll make sure to try to go through as many as we possibly can as well. Before we share our speakers' slots today, I'd like to give you a little bit of an overview about all this and what we do within the community. My name is Mark Kelly, as I mentioned before, and I'm the Chief Customer Officer at Aldis, and I'm the founder of AI Ireland, which is a not-for-profit, which we focus within adding a lot of value within the Irish community to different events and also the AI awards. I'm also an executive search consultant and co-founder at Aldis International. Previously, I've went to uh, Michael Smurf at Business School, I worked in Enterprise Rent-A-Car, and I worked in Brown Thomas throughout my years within university. So all this, all this is a dedicated specialist within AI recruitment. And within our values are ambition, we are listeners, we're learners, we're specialists, and we're unified and we've got drive. Our central hubs are in Brooklyn and Smithfield. Brooklyn where we cover the US and Smithfield where we cover Europe. So we're a community-based recruitment company. So what that means is we run events and meetups across the world. Our most prolific are in Berlin and Dublin and soon to be in, in, soon to be in New York. To give you a bit of an idea of how many events we've done over the last 18 months, we've had over 40 events, over 100 speakers, and combined 7,000 attendees to our meetups. Now that it's gone virtual, it's actually opened this up to a lot, a lot higher volume of audience. In terms of the breakdown of members that actually attend day to day, they had to come from data science, data engineering, machine learning, machine learning engineers, and software engineers. And you can see the different percentages across Dublin and Berlin. Our podcast series, AI in Action and AI Mentors, has compounded month and month in terms of listenerships. In AI in Action, what we look to do is share how business problems can be solved by applying machine learning. Guests talk about how they've solved business problems by applying machine learning and actually getting rid of manual processes and actually making automation, allowing people to work on better problems and moving up the food chain and giving a better customer experience. What AI Mentors, the podcast, is focused on how do you build out a machine learning and data science team? How do you manage it for return on investment? Because these things are not naturally straightforward like a typical engineering cycle, but more you have to look for managing for research and link it to managing for KPIs and return on investment. But this is a very conscientious thing that you need to work on and gain advice within the industry and through trial and error. The very nature of research makes it very difficult for data science to be generating return on investment month in, month out, unless very thoughtful within the process. Within AI Mentors, our guests talk about their environment that they work in, their experience, how they've built up relationships within the industry, and advice that they'd offer them their younger self as well. We have over 100 episodes now, and you can listen to it on Stitcher, Apple iPod, you can listen on to aldus.com and a variety of different sites. So we'd love to get your opinion, and we're aiming to have 150 episodes completed by the end of the year. We're very, very proud to say that all this is one of the most trusted recruitment agencies in Europe, and we've got over 200 five-star reviews, which is one of the most highest-rated customer, highest-rated recruitment companies in Europe, attributed to a number of five stars. Integrity and exceptional service have been one of the most uh, thoughtful points put about ourselves into the Google review search engine, and something that we take very, very seriously. So NLP, and we're really, really excited about our NLP session today. And if you think about it, the industry has got so much bigger in the last couple of years. And there's a few different fundamental reasons for that. By the end of 2020, it's expected that the industry would be worth over 13.8 13 13 billion, which is an incredible figure if you think about it. 
And the reason for this is there's new approaches to NLP, which are being bringing disruptive improvements, which is also engaging for the customer journey as this is changing. You probably have seen the news yesterday, and I won't go into too much detail as Lucas will be speaking about it a little bit later, but OpenAI's GPT-3 came out onto the marketplace and some of the information was shared about how it can actually be applied. So we took some two reviews that we got from, from Forbes and MIT saying OpenAI's new language generator is shockingly good and completely mindless. GP3 is amazing and overhyped. So it's quite interesting to see that the founders of OpenAI and GPT3, they've been trying to dub down expectations, but it's fantastic to see some of the applications already being spoken about as well, but it isn't perfect. To customer journey reimagined, the most exciting thing about, about NLP is some of the challenges that it overcomes and automates some processes, but also just really reimagines the customer journey to provide a more seamless journey. And customers are now expecting this and they want to have a journey that's better. Companies can have a high prediction of why a person will call, which will allow customer agents to be proactive with their service. So taking into consideration some sentiment analysis where people are actually giving their feedback on a product or a service service, customer agents can take this on board and actually see why a person is calling with them and to give more context, really improving the customer experience when you're actually engaging with them and speaking with them. And a lot of the cases, they can actually look to upsell because they're solving problems proactively. So customer expectations are changing with conversational interactions soon becoming the norm. Rather than some of the, of the last couple of years where things were very linear in terms of the questions you would ask, it's becoming a lot more natural. NLP is being applied across multiple domains, and we see the majority of applications across financial services, robotics, connected automotive, and healthcare. And for, for me, the, the re reimagining how this is going to work day to day in a variety of different industries is very, very exciting. In healthcare, you've got between 10 to 15 different data points now that you can access for different customers or different patients and you can bring them together and actually analyze them a lot of cases you can do predictive analytics to see what, what potential health benefits you can get by trying some different exercises or different foods or also looking at previous health history and actually look at how you can proactively manage your health and look at symptoms that could cause you to be ill in the future and how to eradicate them as well so we have got live jobs across Berlin and Dublin currently and across the US. And if people are interested in finding out more about some of these live opportunities, please feel free to reach out to myself or the team at mark at aldus.com or go to aldus.com under jobs and you'll see a variety of different opportunities to look into. We've got positions in natural language processing, we've got data engineering, we've got graph database positions, we've got some more senior level positions at the exec level please feel free to reach out to us. And if you want any other information about our blog postings, about how to find a role in data science or how to find uh, interview preparation or any other information, we have over 50 blogs there that actually gives you advice on actually getting a next, your next role in data science and machine learning engineer. So please feel free to do that. Our podcast series, as I mentioned before, we've got over a 100 podcast series split because computer vision, NLP, uh, customer lifetime value, recommendation engines, how you actually look to build out data lakes, variety of different problems we're looking to solve by sharing insights and information. So please feel free to, to look at that and get, get an input on it. And if you want to get any introductions on that side, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll be able to provide extra information too. Each month, we'll have an NLP series and also a computer vision series. And on Thursday, we've got an additional meetup, which is going to be focused on healthcare. So I hope you're going to tune in for that. More links will be sent on that in the future. What you're also interested in, uh, or if you're interested in getting is additional speakers, or if you'd like to nominate a speaker or get involved in some way, please feel free to reach out to us at info at aldus.com, where we're looking at our next line of speakers for September, October, November, and also in the podcast series, we're looking for additional speakers for that as well. So please feel free to reach out to us and let us know um, if, if you want to provide any information uh, whatsoever too. So I will be passing over to Dave now. I'm just going to make sure that Dave is available. I know he was he had a, a certain uh, deliverable as well. Dave, are you free there? Yes. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I'm now. Great stuff. 
Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, so that was really interesting. Uh, so uh, the, yeah, the GPT-3 stuff is fascinating, but uh, I suppose I have to uh, learn, up, learn up it a bit more. But anyway, I'm just going to describe what happens kind of when the rubber hits the road. So this is sort of a, in practice, what do you end up doing in an NLP, you know, producing, trying to produce an NLP product. So the example I'm giving is of a chatbot for Chinese. So what does that mean? If you uh, are a travel agent in China, there's 3 million of you, uh, and you have questions like, what does this error message I'm seeing on my monitor mean? Or how do I cancel a, a booking? Or these sorts of questions. That there is like a, a problem a chatbot would be good at. Uh, but in order to do that, you what you want to do is you want to take a question that comes in figure out what the answer is and then in future a similar question comes in you want to go right that's the kind of answer we mean so this is called a supervised machine learning problem where you've seen examples of the answers before you've seen when someone asks to cancel a ticket that that means cancel a ticket whereas unsupervised are things like uh, k-means clustering which is things like tell me how many kinds of news stories are in it, this particular news database, these sorts of things where you're not sure even what question you're asking. If you keep in mind email, people are kind of used to the idea of spam email and real email. If you keep in mind a, a NLP classifier, it's kind of like that. If you keep uh, the idea of, you know, how would you judge whether something was a real email or a fake email, those sorts of the questions, if you get that in your, in your basic mind, you can sort of understand the sort of more complicated questions that come from that. So when I say supervised, what do I mean? I mean, there's a ground truth, there's a description, there's examples of uh, classes and a label on them. So it sounds like a fancy name or supervised sounds like a fancy name, but if you think of this just like a spreadsheet that has example data, questions you're gonna see and the label is gonna be on it. Uh, now, for example, if this was images, it'd be pictures of dogs and the label would be dog or cat or whatever was the picture, you know, the label in the picture. So supervised training, tends to be, you know, all the deep learning, almost all the deep learning systems you hear about so tend to be supervised. Uh, unsupervised is used a good bit, but supervised tends to be more common in machine learning at the moment. So this, this is one of those sorts of uh, issues, one of those sorts of uh, systems. Now, when I talk about chatbots and this sort of stuff, IBM Watson, Google Dialogflow, a lot of the big guys have systems to do this sort of stuff, and they have nice user interfaces and everything. Uh, there's also a few open source frameworks, which I'll go into details on later. But you know, it's a fairly big business. A lot of chatbots are out there being made. Maybe not so many good ones, but that's a separate issue. But people kind of understand the value of a, you know, a, a conversational interface where you know someone's typing in WhatsApp or, or something like this, as opposed to just waiting on a phone, having to you know talk to a call center agent and all these things that you know take time and cost money. Okay, so in this case, we had. Uh, 5,000 to 10,000 labeled utterances in Chinese. So they came along to us and said, "Why right, we are Travel Sky, the big airline, uh, G, uh, G, uh, big airline helping. It's kind of a, here we have uh, here we have two uh, two big sort of companies that work in the back end dealing with tickets, uh, and we're in China. There's one, and it's huge. Usually, when you go to a European uh, company or even some of this in the Middle East and you say right well, we're going to try and make you a chatbot you can sort of over the course of a few weeks get together 500 questions then while you're building the chatbot while you're doing user tests over time you gradually get up to about 2,000 example sort of questions or things people have said in your data set in China it's totally different day one they hand over 5,000 to 10,000 here look here's all the questions we have they have huge amounts of data which just flips the problems around totally different. Anyway, just to remind you, an utterance, or think of it as a question, and the label you attach to it, an intent, that's what you're trained at is, that's your grain truth. So in China, if you're ever dealing with China, getting data isn't the problem. In Europe, pretty much always getting data is a problem. And still labeling, it's an issue, but that's one for another talk. Here we're talking about the engine. Okay, so why would you go and build an AI engine? Seeing as Google have one, IBM have one, Amazon have one, or a few other companies have one. In China, these big sort of Western companies can't deploy their code, so they don't really exist in, a, you know, you, you, you have to sort of uh, tunnel out to through the great firewall to get to the 
uh, Watson engine in in Japan or something, and that just physically takes time. You know, matter when you move so fast or light when you move so fast. The also you're relying upon the great firewall of trying not to decide to cut you off someday, which is just not a great idea. Uh, the other issue is like Europeans, like Americans, no one likes sending their data outside of the country. So in the same way, Chinese people want to keep the data in the country, if, if at all possible. One thing is the cost of Watson and Dialogflow is essentially free. They are really, really cheap. There is versions of these AI engines in China, but they're really expensive. And sometimes you can't even get them. They just have a totally different model over there. So like Baidu have one, but it was a really expensive and they wouldn't even let you use it. So I don't understand what they were doing. So the short version of that is if you're building AI in China, frequently you want to build it on premises just because how things work over there. So in an NLP pipeline, there's various steps, sort of an A to Z as I think of it. And if you go through all those steps in A to Z, you can quite rapidly get a pretty good answer. And that's kind of what I'm talking about today how to go from A to Z and get a good answer. It may not be perfect. Maybe you'll go back and fix some letters to get you a higher accuracy later on. But it's just, you know, do you want it now or do you want it now or do you want it pretty? Let's get it working. Let's get something that produces value for the customer. And then we can we have time then to improve our algorithms or whatever else we want to do uh, to boost our accuracy then later. So steps in the pipeline. You have to read in the data. You have to figure out what the words are in the data. You have to get a machine to be able to understand what words mean, which sounds kind of strange, but I'll explain to you now in a minute. Then there's various manipulations you carry out on the data to uh, make it easier for a machine to separate out what's being asked about. And then you get into stuff like the tests and making sure that what you've done is good enough and these sort of tests and everything. So if you go through all those sort of steps, you know, get data, make sure the machine can understand it, carry out some analysis to see what's the best way to chop up the data so the machine can understand it, and then test to make sure you're doing right. That's kind of what happens in almost all NLP projects. Now, Chinese is slightly different. I don't speak Chinese. I was working with a Chinese colleague, uh, and they were great to help. But there is some interesting stuff about the language. I'm only going to scratch the surface here now. But uh, one thing is they don't have spaces. Uh, spaces were, weren't weren't in Latin, for example, originally. They were added by some Irish monks about the year 700 or something like this. So our Irish people invented the space. It's a fun uh, quiz fact for you. So you have to get a word segmenter. And uh, this LTP was the best segmenter we found. There's a few of them around, uh, but this was the best for separating words. This is an area you do need a fluent speaker for it as well, because certain kind of unusual words will be broken out badly so if you can imagine say iphone is turned into the letter i and the word phone with a space between them and you want to sort of go no in our domain some of the weird unusual words we, we're using you've gotten these wrong and we sort of train you up on those new words so word segmentation is something that happens in chinese there is some of the language as well that don't have spaces uh, there's plenty of good word segmenters out there but they do need to be augmented for your domain for the four or five common words for your domain that is getting wrong. So I'll go into some of those more details in a bit, but so Chinese word segmentation, just that's a good system. It's, uh, it's available at ltp.ai, uh, and you do need a person to look at it because there's gonna be some word from your domain that's getting wrong. So recruitment, maybe it breaks into two words or something like this, and you say, no, if you see recruitment, remember it's one word. Now, this is, this is kind of the interesting bit. So there's lots of ways to try and get a computer to understand text. And kind of the simplest way to do is to say, imagine that all the words in English or the common words in English. So aardvark to zebra, you know, all the common words. And you would turn that into a, like an array, a vector to say, did I see aardvark? Did I see and? Did I see yada, 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 all the way through until you get to zebra? Did I see zebra? I did one. You would then have a an array a vector of zeros and ones that would say all the words I saw in this document. Yeah, that's called a, a string to word vector. So it's turning the words you see into just a list of list of ones and zeros. Now this can be 
very long, but frequently it's about 2,000 uh, words long. And then you have a vector that you can compare to other vectors. And you could say something as simple as, which of the vectors I've seen before have the most ones in common at the same location as this new que question has come in? And I'll say, all right, the question has come in is, can I cancel a, a plane ticket? And this tick this one we've seen before is, is I want to cancel a plane ticket. There's an awful lot of the vectors that match up. That's the closest we've seen before. That's probably what they mean. And even that's relatively okay as a classifier. So people think of classifiers as really complicated, really strange things or whatever, but something as simple as turn all the examples I've seen into a array of ones and zeros. And then when a new question comes in, turn it into an array in the same way and see which one is most similar. Even that's a classifier that worked pretty well a lot of the time. Uh, so this is some of the sort of the weeds of making chatbots, uh, but you're here, so hopefully you're interested. TFIDF is a really common technique, term frequency inverse document frequency. Uh, if you think of it, if a word is used an awful lot of times in a document, if say it's a football document and it mentions Messi four times, you're pretty sure it's about Barcelona or about Messi or something like that. Uh, IDF is like how often you'd expect the word to occur. So if a word's really common, like, you know, de or a uh, or uh, walk or house, or, you know, the common sort of words you hear, it doesn't tell you that much about a document. Whereas if a word's a really rare word, it's not something that comes up very often, that kind of tells you more. You know, the fact that, say, messy's in a document tells you something in a way that uh, walk doesn't. Do you know what I mean? It just tells you kind of more about the document. So TFIDF tends not to actually work in chatbots because they're so short that you don't tend to get the same word occurring twice or anything. And the domain is fairly narrow, so it doesn't tend to be that many rare words. Stop words is another common technique in NLP where you just remove the sort of glue words of a sentence, the as, the there's, the ands, because uh, they don't tell you that much about the topic of the sentence. They just tell you about the, you know, how words relate to each other. It doesn't work in Chinese. There isn't that many stop words in Chinese. It's not how the language works. Uh, so just stop words, TFIDF, these are standard techniques you'll try on any NLP ch uh, challenge, but sometimes they won't work. So this is just another example I went into. How do you compare arrays? Uh, something as simple as how many of them do we have, in, you know, how many of them match up? Or it's a thing called cosine distance you probably did in school, which is uh, how close together they are pretty much. And then there's all these other cool algorithms that we use all the time. Uh, to do comparisons but if you just keep in your in your head that oh i've got an array i've got loads of arrays i have this new question that comes in i turn it into an array and let's do a comparison you know that kind of gets rid of some of the magic some of the mystery behind machine learning oh what are we doing we're comparing arrays all right that doesn't sound so difficult so this is something in nlp that's very common where it's engrams if what I was describing there was called bag of words, which is like, did this word occur somewhere in the sentence? And that tells you something, but sometimes the words being together tells you more. You know, credit card, both in the sentence tells you something. Credit card together, it's pretty, you know, the topic is probably around credit cards then. So it's it's another thing along with TFIDF and these things that you check is, can looking at a window bigger than one word at a time, can that improve the amount of information I can extract from the, the data? Uh, that does seem to work fairly well in Chinese. It's a, it's, it's a common technique in most languages. It's worth checking always. Then there is lots of other issues in Chinese. Uh, spelling works in a totally different way. Spelling mistakes in particular. The spelling mistakes are always, always a challenge, always difficult. But in Chinese, it's based on how words sound in a way that doesn't really happen in English. Uh, they use a technique called pinyin, which is fascinating, which is based on the sound of the words. That's how they create them. Uh, the guy who invented this like died last year or maybe early the year before uh which is kind of mad if you think of it you know imagine having your linkedin i invented text it would just be kind of strange to imagine that uh and then there's other stuff you do in languages where if you think there's words in english like recommend where i recommended recommendation can you make any uh recommendations these sorts of things kind of all go to recommend they all you know if you were to chop them off and just say every time they use one of these recommendy words, it just means recommend. It's called stemming. Doesn't really happen in Chinese. Doesn't seem to help that much. Uh, in the European languages, 
in particularly Spanish, it really helps. French, it helps a bit. Uh, so stemming is just another thing you try in your A to Z of making an LP product. In Chinese, it doesn't happen to particularly particularly work. Uh, and there's lots of other stuff in Chinese, obviously. It's, it's a very rich, uh, it's a more rich language than English in almost every way. But we're just trying to, it's one of the reasons chatbots are quite interesting because what you're trying to do is say you've got 50 intents you might have up to 200 but 50 is a reasonable number to start with 50 things you might be able to guess you know this is about cancelling a ticket this is about booking a ticket 50 of those topics if you know what i mean uh, you're just trying to get to the right bucket you're just trying to land in the right spot you don't have to be perfect if you know what i mean so a translation if you get one word wrong it'll just sound wonky and won't make any sense but it's okay to be slightly wrong in a chatbot because all you're trying to do is get to the right Ta uh, label you don't have to get every single word correct so the nlp and chatbots is in some ways slightly easier so simple pipeline first of all you want to find where the spaces go to actually be able to extract the words because the words are where the information is that's the uh, the library we use for that so that's the best library we found then we found the best actual uh the best actual way to chop up the words in terms of all those different options you can try with engrams and all this sort of stuff was minimum three occurrences i think that's changed to 2000 words since and a biogram tokenizer so keep the 2000 most common words that you've definitely seen at least three times in your training data and you're looking at two word tokens and then the particular classifier there's a few of these but one that works very well always uh, uh, you know out of the box is svm uh it's an old older uh, classifier but it works really well it's really fast so you can come up you know some of the deep learning training systems take a long time to train up so you don't have that that tight uh try something check something does it work uh iterative improvement cycle that you can do with the older fashioned algorithms we ended up being i think it was within about two percent of watson with these sort of very basic scikit learn out of the box uh classifying system made very fast there is hacks you can do that's actually brought us up to closer to Watson. Uh, things like uh, entities. If someone says, I want to book a ticket from Dublin to London, the fact that they've mentioned two cities is kind of inf interesting information in terms of guessing what their intent is. You know, if you're trying to uh, cancel a ticket, maybe you don't mention the cities. You know, there's lots of the intents you mentioned where you don't mention a city. So, uh, a system that kind of finds those entities and tells the system, by the way, they're using these entities. These mean something. Uh, entities here are like proper nouns, if you know what I mean, like those sort of uh, dates, uh, countries, those sorts of things that are capitalized. If if you tell the system kind of what they mean, that it means like a date or it means you know something important, it tends to fairly boost the uh, the accuracy of your classification system by 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 enough. Uh, you can use parts of speech tagging, there's sort of cunning ways you can put them in. This is where you're saying this is the verb in the sentence and this is the noun, this is the subject and this is the object, this sort of stuff. It doesn't tend to help it that much and adds a bit of complexity to your system. It's always worth trying, but it's where you actually use it in the full NLP system. Uh, there's weird stuff for Chinese and hypernyms that seem to really help, but I won't go into the details now. It's kind of out into the weeds of NLP for Chinese. And like all of these things, there's a sort of a, do you want it pretty or do you want it now trade-off? We're making, you know, we said we get a good system within a few percent of Watson quickly, and then we'll go back and we'll do the deep learning and everything to make it better. So let me just check my time here, are we doing? Ah, glad. Okay, so yeah, no deep learning, not yet. We'll go back when we have a bit more data, uh, when we have a bit more time. Spacey is actually really good and really easy to use. Uh, so uh, we, we, we're testing Spacey at the moment, and it does seem to be, you know, it's actually getting pretty much similar results, but it's the sort of thing is, because there's so many people working on Spacey, because it's one of these libraries that people work on, we know it's going to keep improving all the time. Uh, so certain kinds of sort of basic uh, deep learning techniques like word embeddings can be really handy. Uh, we, we've started to integrate them into this, but I just wanted to describe a simple pipeline that gives you good results today. So basic proof of concept was like a Python Flask application. 
uh, returns JSON uh, very quick, even on a laptop, because it's such a simple system. We built SVMs are well understood, and all the sort of steps we're talking about are pretty basic. There is a system, a, a chatbot system that the pipeline you've built can slide into. It's called Rasa. It's a fairly steep learning curve, but it's the best of the, the open source frameworks for chatbots that I've found. Uh, it, they have a, we recommend this pipeline for Chinese, but it was total muck. It was like well over 10% worse than the one I've just shown you. So uh, do use Rasa, it's really good. It does take a bit to learn, like all these frameworks, like if you use Rails or anything like this, the framework itself has opinions that means you have to learn your learn to change to, to meet the framework, uh, but it is great. But maybe build your own uh, pipeline uh, rather than trust the one they've given you, at least out of the box. Uh, but, you know, again, their pipeline, I'm sure, is improving it all, all the time as well. Anyway, so there is the Watson to this world. There is the Googles with dialogue, uh, dialogue flow and these sorts of things, but you can build a successful NLP uh, system, you know, using open source Python tools really easily. And you can actually, you know, provide value to the customer or to your boss or whatever really quickly with these sort of out of the box systems. If you make sure you're testing and you're making sure that everything you do is actually improving things, they quickly add up and then you're able to do these classifications that even if it's something as simple as you know, we're classifying email and saying who this should go to, who's the best person to respond to this email, those sorts of systems you can put together really uh, fast and they really do good value. And I think actually that might be what the next talk is on. So I'm looking forward to hearing this one as well. Two. Now we're going to pass on to, to Lucas. Lucas, are you all, you all set there? Yes, thanks. Fantastic, thank you, Lucas. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks so much, Mark, for the kind introduction, and thanks, Dave, for the very insightful presentation. Um, I'm looking forward to sharing um, a bit of an overview of the recent developments in natural language processing and sort of an high over, a high level overview of the, the trends of the last couple of years. So before I jump right into it, let me give you a quick overview of what we're doing at Createx and about myself. So at Createx, we're building an AI writing assistant that helps customer facing teams lose uh, less time when, uh, when communicating with customers by getting rid of the need to write the same phrases over and over again. And this goes beyond templates because we um, suggest sentences uh, based on the context of a message. And I'll show you a little bit more of this um, towards the end of my talk. Um, about myself, I have a background in statistics. So I did a lot of math and programming at university in Berlin and in Paris. I was then at Cyber Angel doing natural language processing, that's a cybersecurity startup in Paris, and then did um, data analytics at Tesla. So um, during this talk, I'll be covering three, uh, three areas. One is going to be a little bit of the NLP history of the last, uh, last uh, decade, so to speak. Um, then we'll look a little bit at the transformer architecture, which, um, which has been around since 2017. And finally, we look at, um, at the, the recent trends of what's been happening over the last couple of months and uh, last couple of years. So before we uh, dive into, into, the, into the history, um, there are lots of uh, different things that you can do with um, NLP. One of them being um, sort of classification models, like we heard um, in the last talk, where you basically say, is this A or is this B? For example, is this um, this type of intent, or is this another type of intent, or is this um, is this um, a positive sentiment or a negative sentiment? And a type of models that I'll be focusing on is called sequence-to-sequence -sequence models, where you have as input one sequence, one text, and as output another text. And the prime example for this is machine translation, where the input is a sentence in one language, and the output is the same sentence in a different language, or it could also be multiple sentences. Um, the way most of these models work is that you have 
the input sentence, which get, then goes into the first model called the encoder, which encodes the, the knowledge into, into a numerical representation, and which is then passed on to a second model called the decoder, which decodes that knowledge and um, cr creates the output sentence. In this case, the, the French sentence, je suis un étudiant, is uh, translated to I'm a student. And typically, um, typically, um, or traditionally, both the encoder and the decoder are so-called recurrent neural networks. Recurrent neural networks are neural networks that take into that, that take into account a sequence and that use the output from the previous step to predict the next step. And therefore, they can use the 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 first word, for example, to then correctly translate the second word and so on. And this is very useful, but also has some drawbacks. We'll come back to that later. So now let's look at um, sort of the developments of the last uh, last couple of years. So the the first important breakthrough to mention here is um, the development of uh, word embeddings, um, namely word to vec and glove. Um, Dave quickly uh, mentioned them towards the end of his talk, where these are basically representations of words as vectors or as um, as, as numbers and. The difference to just uh, representing the words as zeros and ones is that here, words that are similar in, in the context that they are used in, for example, uh, police officer and policeman, um, they get very similar values. So their vectors, which are then fed into the next step, um, are very similar. And usually embeddings like word to vec or glove, they can then be used to encode the input sequence, which is then afterwards passed on to the, to the encoder. So this sits between the input and the encoder. And this was used for sequence to sequence models, but one drawback of these uh, sequence to sequence models with the two recurrent neural networks was that there's just this one step in the middle where information is passed from the encoder to the decoder. And this was changed uh, towards 2014, 2015, with a mechanism called att attention. Uh, there were different types of attention, and attention allows models to pay attention to different parts of the input sequence while creating the um, uh, while creating the output uh, sentence. So, in the example where we wanted to translate and get the uh, get the sentence, um, "I am a student." Um, when, when predicting the word M, for example, we would be paying attention to the words je and sui. And so, so the use of attention made these models a lot better. Um, machine translation really improved significantly when attention was introduced. But there was still a bottleneck between uh, because scaling these recurrent neural networks was a challenge as every step in a recurrent neural network depends on the steps before. So you cannot parallelize the steps. You need to um, execute the steps one after another, which means that there's a certain limit to how big you can make the models before they take too, too much time to run. And this um, speed bottleneck and computational complexity bottleneck was um, solved in 2017 by the influential um, attention is all you need paper, which introduced the transformer architecture. And what, uh, what is a transformer? Basically, a transformer is a type of sequence to sequence model where we don't use recurrent neural networks anymore. Um, and I'll show you the, the architecture in a little bit more detail um, in a moment. But what's really important here is we don't have the um, recurrent neural network anymore. And instead, we have what's called self-attention and, um, and a feed-forward neural network, which is something that you can parallelize. So you can, in parallel, make a lot of computations across even different uh, GPUs and therefore 
significantly speed up the process of not only the training, but also the inference. And therefore, um, because it's so much faster, you can make much bigger models, which then also lead to better results. And since the transformer architecture was proposed, many applications of it um, have been published and have, um, yeah, have been very successfully used. Probably one, uh, one very uh, famous one was in 2018, the, the BERT architecture um, developed at Google. Um, it's a special case of a transformer, which is just taking the, the left side, the encoder part, and which can then be used to analyze text. So in it's, it's, since it's not having the decoder, BERT is um, used less for uh, machine translation or tasks where the output is a text sequence, but more for um, problems where you want to analyze a certain text. For example, if you want to do sentiment analysis or whether you, when you want to do different types of text classification. Um, last year, OpenAI published GPT-2, which is the exact opposite of BERT. While BERT is, uh, is an encoder, GPT-2 just has the right side of the transformer. It's a, it's a decoder, and it's used to output language. It's, uh, it's a language model, which means given an input text, it predicts the next words to come, so it can be used to write text. and uh, the way this works is you give it some text and then it continues the text. And it's, um, yeah, what was very uh, groundbreaking about this is that it's so good at predicting the next words that the text that it, that's out, that it outputs really sounds like a human, um, while, um, while the content is not always perfect. So um, it, while, the, while it seems like it has been written by, by a human, the, the, content, the content of the text might sometimes be um, complete nonsense. And um, a model that combines the aspects of BERT uh, and GPT-2 is, for example, T5, published late last year, again by Google. Um, this is, again, um, a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. So it takes as input a text and then outputs another text and has, for example, been shown to be very successful at answering questions at uh, doing question answering and uh, particularly also at um, closed book question answering. I'll have an example on that um, um, later. And uh, Mark mentioned it uh, in the beginning, um, GPT-3 um, came out just a couple of weeks ago, um, created a huge hype. Um, it's currently not openly accessible, only by an API, which you need to uh, get, um, get access to. It's like GPT-2, uh, a model to generate text, but um, is much, much bigger, trained on significantly more, more data and has 100 times as many parameters as uh, GPT-2, which was only published last year. So there's been a, a huge increase in the, in the model size. Now let's have a closer look at, uh, at, the trans uh, at the transformer architecture. The transformer architecture is um, basically, um, it, it's a sequence to sequence model. And both on the encoder side and on the decoder side, you have different stacks of, um, of encoders or decoders. Here in the visualization, there are just six, but uh, because that's the number that was used in the original paper, but nowadays, um, many, many more layers are used um, since yeah, models are getting much, much bigger. Um, but it's very useful that it's possible to just stack different uh, encoders and decoders on top of each other, which makes uh, it easy to scale up the, the model size. Each encoder consists of two parts and each decoder of three parts. So in the encoder, we have, um, we have a self-attention part that shows how the different words in the, in the input sequence are interlinked and how they, um, how they, how they sort of, um, how they correlate and what information they share. And that's, um, 
followed by a feed-forward neural network. And the feed-forward neural network, as mentioned earlier, makes this so much faster because we don't need the recurring aspect anymore that we had in the recurrent neural network. And the decoder looks much, uh, much like the encoder with the self-attention and the feed-forward neural network. But in addition, there is um, the encoder-decoder um, attention, which is very similar to attention that was used also in, in, in previous models. Now, there are several trends that, uh, that we've been able to observe over the last uh, couple months, a couple of years. One is definitely um, the trend towards larger and bigger models. Um, there's, there's sort of this um, movement by researchers. They are in competition. They want to get the best scores for the leaderboards. Um, there are different benchmarks that compare different um, models. They're called, for example, there's the glue benchmark, there's the super glue benchmark. These are benchmarks where a model is tested on different types of, um, of challenges for models, and then the models uh, are comparable. And of course, there's an interest for researchers to, to get scores that are as high as possible, and therefore they're chasing to the top. And this is um, done by a bigger and bigger models. Um, in 2018, the BERT model had 340 million parameters. Then last year, GPT-2 had 1.5 billion parameters. So always already five times bigger. Now um, the GPT-3 model is even 100x bigger than uh, the GPT-2 model. Interestingly, um, at the same time, there's the opposite trend towards smaller models. And this is because the bigger models are, of course, yielding better results. But um, to, uh, to deploy models, it's also interesting to have smaller models that run faster and uh, that don't need as much computational power. And one important example to mention here is the distal bird model um, created by Hugging Face last year. And what they did is they, they, took, they took the original bird model and then they trained a smaller model, which had a very similar architecture to the BERT model, to learn from the original BERT model. And that way they had um, a significantly smaller model, but that was already um, almost as good as the original BERT model. Then a third uh, trend when we look at uh, the aspect of um, text generation, is the trend towards controllable text generation. While GPT-2 still um, created a lot of nonsense text, for example, there's the example of the researcher who, go, who went to the Andean mountains to and, and discovered a herd of unicorns. Um, and then uh, there's an, an, an entire page about, um, about this researcher and the, the unicorns that he supposedly found. And it's complete no nonsense invented by the model. It's an example that OpenAI published on their website. Um, so while GPT-2 did sort of this nonsense, there have been other models uh, over the last month that have been able to create content that is more correct on the, um, yeah, on the factual level. For example, Salesforce um, AI published a model called CTRL. Um, CTRL is a model where you can specify different parameters. For example, they created fake uh, CNN articles. And just by modifying a date parameter, they were able to indicate to the model whether uh, Donald Trump or Barack Obama would be the US president mentioned in the article. And yeah, so we're seeing research going more towards um, content creation that's more correct. And um, a fourth trend attacks the problem of um, the need for huge amounts of training data. In the past, you needed huge amounts of uh, data that you had to label yourself so that you could train your models. And uh, we're now seeing a trend that uh, goes into the direction of needing less, less data yourself because 
um, of two of two different um, steps. The first step is fine tuning uh, of previously pre-trained models. This can be um, called transfer learning, and it means that you take a model that's already been trained on huge amounts of data, for example, by Google in the case of BERT, and then the, the model already has basic knowledge about text. It already understands what the sentence is. It understands basic, like not, not only basic, but it understands grammar. And then you just need to show it a few examples of your own texts to understand the context or to learn the context of your own language. And then it's able to make good predictions. And um, therefore, this fine-tuning approach is uh, really, really useful. Um, not only you need um, less labeled data yourself, but also it's much faster to uh, train a model because you don't need to run it for, uh, for huge amounts of time. And few shot uh, um, learning is uh, what's, been, what's become especially big with GPT-3, where the idea is to not even fine tune the model anymore. The, model, the idea is really to just have a general pre-trained model, in this case, GPT-3, and gen then to show it just a very few examples, maybe two, three, four, five examples, to tell the model what the context is, and then let the model uh, make the predictions. So it's really much different from uh, what we know from traditional machine learning. Um, yeah, maybe just um, a couple more um, examples from recent um, from recent um, um, papers. Here's, for example, um, an example of how a chatbot, Mina, uh, developed by Facebook, learned to to make jokes or make um, a play on words. So there's the there's the person who asks. Um, what did the cow study? The chatbot replies, bovine sciences. The person asks, do horses ever go to Harvard? And the, chatbots make, the chatbot makes the plain word, uh, horses go to Hayward. And um, another impressive example are the question answer um, pairs uh, by GPT-3. I mentioned um, T5 as the first model that really did closed book um, question answering. What, uh, what do I mean by closed book? Traditionally, when you trained a machine learning model to do question answering, you would always give it three things. You would give it a, a paragraph with certain information, then a question that was about that paragraph, and thirdly, um, the answer. And then the model would, uh, would be trained and then it would learn how to make um, the prediction um, of the, um, it would learn how to combine the, the question and the, the input par uh, paragraph to come up with the answer. Now, and then you could just put in new paragraphs with new questions and it, the model would be able to find the answers in the, in the paragraphs. Now with G5 and GPT-3, it's different. We don't have the paragraph anymore. We just give it the question and the model has to come up with the answer by itself based on what it learned during the learning process. And here, for example, um, some of the questions and some of the, answer, some of the answers are actually pretty, um, um, are re pretty good and pretty uh, surprisingly good. For example, when you go to the last one, um, when you ask GPT-3, why don't, why don't animals have three legs? GPT-3 comes up with a human-sounding answer of animals don't have three legs because they would fall over, which shows that GPT-3 has some type of reasoning. And despite this, it's possible to, um, to trick GPT-3 into giving um, complete nonsense, um, uh, complete nonsense, answers. So there's a very good, cool blog post. I uh, suggest you check it out. It's called Giving GPT-3 a Turing Test. Um, and later in the blog post, um, when you ask questions to the model that absolutely make no sense, and then um, GPT-3 is all, also coming to, to its limits and then gives answers um, that are completely, completely off. Um, finally, 
towards the end, I'd like to show you what uh, we are doing at CreateText. So we are using some of these recent trends in transformers and um, using that to build a tool that uh, that assists users uh, in their writing process with repetitive writing. So here, for example, you see an email, and while you type, we suggest you sentences that you typically would write in a similar context. So it's like on Amazon where you get predicted people who bought this also buy this. Um, then we say typically when you write this type of text, you also would, would like to use uh, this type of uh, sentence. And it's uh, based on the context and your personal uh, writing style. So thanks a lot for, for your attention. And if you have any question, it's happy to answer. And also um, happy to answer any NLP questions uh, you might have, reach out, happy to have a chat. Or um, if you would like to become one of the first users of our tool, also <laughs> let me know. Lucas, thank you very much for that. That was absolutely fascinating as well. I'm I'm just so excited about this. Where where do you think this can go with with OpenAI? And you know, it's it's kind of interesting to see how the founders are kind of playing it down a bit. They're they're kind mm -hmm. of like, you know, there's a lot of hype there, it's not as good. Yeah where some other people are getting really excited about it. And, and I kind of see what you're saying, how easy it's to trick it. And you know, there was numerous other examples that I had to hand. Do you, is, this, is this a game changer? Is this, was this moment yesterday a game, a game changer? So I, I don't think that now just, just the um, release of, or the, um, the creation of GPT-3 was a complete game changer because it's a trend that we've been seeing over the last couple of years and it's just one of the next steps on uh, on the road towards uh, really human like text creation and um, completely correct text text creation so you think it's more of a kind of a, it's, it's it's kind of an evolution it's just naturally yes yes i think it, it, it gets better every year so um in 2018, OpenAI published GPT. It was a great model. Then last year, GPT-2 was much better. And now GPT-3 is the next step. And probably next year, we'll have uh, GPT-4. Yeah, I was looking at, earlier on, I was looking at a graph of the ACI uh, publications and how it's just spiking. To have, have a, new, yeah. a new work that's coming through uh, there. So we had, a, we had a few questions that, that came in. Um, sure. One was from a, a budding uh, data scientist who wants to get more involved in kind of building out some some personal projects, and he was asking about any particular uh, advice on that or projects to get access to good data sets, or if you're starting off um, anywhere, you'd probably point the person. Um, yeah, I think there there are there are tons uh, tons of exciting projects uh, one could do. So, for example. Um, just working with Twitter data, that's something I usually really like. Um, just um, using the Twitter APIs, which are free up to a certain um, up to a certain volume to get some data and then analyze that. I think that that can be uh, very insightful and it it can be super useful to, yeah, build a little por portfolio for oneself as a data scientist. It's also possible to write, write a quick uh, medium post to talk about um, about the architecture and that I think is uh, is very useful for any data scientist that's great any particular industries that you're most excited about in the coming coming years that can be impacted um, I believe that um, any industry that has lots of communication will be highly can highly benefit from NLP and so naturally there are um, functions like customer service, um, that can very strongly benefit from NLP, but I believe it's really going to support everyone. For example, we can also imagine uh, NLP helping you with internal communication in large companies where um, NLP just can help you communicate faster and better and um, therefore lose less time and also less brain power on communication. That's great, Dave. If you're, you, you can hear me okay. Would you see any other industries or domains that you're particularly excited about? 
Yeah, I think that's a good point around it's kind of triage is how I, I would describe it, where it's not necessarily doing all the work, but it's trying to figure out the right person to get the work to and maybe annotating the work in such a way to say, look, here's the interesting thing. Here's the, you know, here's the interesting, you know, here's the important information. This sort of stuff NLP is very good at rather than doing everything a human does. It more augments people as opposed to sort of replaces them or anything. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, can you see the human in the loop being taken out in the next kind of three to four years? Is that a, you know, is it it's because, or do you kind of keep keep them in there for a while longer? I, I would say no. I don't see anything close to sort of a general AI that that would employ. Uh, but see, one of the ways to think about this is, if you've ever been in an old-fashioned bank, some countries still have them, they're full of people counting money. Uh, I was in a bank in Syria years ago, and I was like, what is going on here? And it's just because there's rows and rows of people counting money. And that doesn't happen in you know, Western banks anymore because we have ATM machines and, you know, they count the money. And it's just like, it's not that, you know, still lots of people work in banks. It's not that, you know, the ATM machine fired everybody. It's just it got rid of the really boring bit of banking. It's the same with Excel. Excel didn't get rid of any accountants. It just got rid of the really boring bit of being an accountant. And I think certainly at the stage where AI is at the moment, it's just augmenting people. It's not really replacing them at all. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's it, you know it allows them just to move up the food chain just do more better work more yeah. creative more creative work as well and uh, it's fascinating to see how you can reimagine just so many different landscapes with this in terms of the customer journey is as well because the customers want that kind of netflix experience where it just works yeah right you know, every, yeah. yeah they just it, they have that so a lot, lot of potential which which is really exciting well i'd like to thank uh, dave kern and Lucas Kemkis for your time today. Uh, the presentation will be made available uh, for people to, to read over as, as well. Uh, Lucas's podcast is, is, is on aldus.com if people want to reach out and listen to it. And I'm sure Dave will be doing a podcast in, in the not distant future as well. We'd be delighted to have you on as well. Our next meetup is on Thursday. So I hope to see everyone at us. And for now, thank you very much for everyone's time today. See you. Bye. Thanks, Thanks again.